Good morning, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. I'm Cheryl Gann, the NCSSM Durham Math Department Chair. I want to add my welcome to you all and my sincere hope that in the near future, I will be welcoming you to our campus for TCM conferences or other visits. I have the great privilege of introducing our keynote speaker, Dr. Rochelle Gutierrez. Dr. Gutierrez currently serves as a professor of Latina, Latino Studies and Mathematics Education at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Urbana Dr. Gutierrez has been recognized with numerous awards, including the 2016 Iris M. Carl Distinguished Leadership and Equity Award from Todos Mathematics for All. Dr. Gutierrez earned her MA and PhD in Curriculum and Instruction at the University of Chicago after completing her BA in Human Biology at Stanford University. In fact, it was an art history professor at Stanford who helped redirect Dr. Gutierrez from pre-med to a career in education. After discussions with him in which she raised questions and challenged him on issues, such as the low underrepresented minority population at Stanford, Dr. Gutierrez claimed art professor, then asked something along the lines of, why not do something more challenging, like be a teacher? Fortunately for educators and for students, she took this advice to heart. Dr. Gutierrez teaches courses for education students, including a secondary mathematics methods course for undergraduates, and a course in socio-political perspectives on mathematics and science education for graduate students. She also teaches an undergraduate seminar for all students on social justice, schooling, and society. Though now a college professor, Dr. Gutierrez identifies strongly with her roots as a middle and high school teacher. As such, her work is focused on advocating, and advocating for, teachers for teachers and for students, and for students including challenging including deficit views of students who are Black, Latinx, and Indigenous. Dr. Gutierrez's willingness to challenge grew out of her own experience as a member of an activist family. Her work has been inspired by her upbringing, by her desire to help others understand the perspective she gained through this upbringing, and by her dislike of following procedures without reason. Her life and education journey has led her to research in the areas of access, equity, identity, and what she has come to call the rehumanizing of mathematics. Dr. Gutierrez's work on this mindset was brought together with other scholars for the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics 2018 Annual Perspectives in Mathematics Education, titled Rehumanizing Mathematics for Black, Indigenous, and Latinx Students. As she explains in the introduction, introduction of that book, beyond being seen as a legitimate participant, a doer of mathematics, a student should be able to feel whole as a person to draw upon all of their cultural and linguistic resources while participating in school mathematics. Please join me now in welcoming Dr. Gutierrez as she speaks on restoring mathematics for our future. Dr. Gutierrez, please feel free to begin whenever you are ready. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be speaking with uh, with teachers. Uh, I, that's that's my old uh, the old hat I wore, and it's something that I really miss being in the classroom on a regular basis. Though, um, I want to start by um, just acknowledging that um, I'm currently on the homelands and the unceded territories of the Peoria, the Kaskaskia, the Piankasha, Wea, Twaitwe. Sauk, Odawa, Maskutan, Kickapoo, Barwadmik, Anishinaabe, and Chickasha nations. And I encourage you, uh, I encourage you to think about, I say that we need to start by being having truth and right relations because I encourage you to think about whose lands you're currently on. Um, at the bottom there, you see a website that's nativeland.canada and you can search to see whose lands you're currently on. Um, I think it's important for us to think about the fact that these, the lands that we're on are past, present, and future are the, the original stewards um, of this place. And so thinking about not just 
um, these kinds of land acknowledgements are important, not just for us to kind of recognize land as relative, but it's to think about what is our responsibility? Um, what is the kind of reciprocity and the reparation that needs to happen for us to be able to move forward and to be in those right relations? Because historically we have not. And so how do we continue to care for these lands? How do we continue to honor um, those who have cared for these lands and think about um, how we can participate. So it's more than just becoming knowledgeable. Um, I've placed a, a website down there at the bottom again, that's the um, uh, Alliance of Indian Mathematics Circles. And there's a place where you can find out, is there, a, is there an Indian math circle that is um, close to you, that you can contribute to, that you can participate in, um, or that you can learn more about. But we are all in a crisis. Um, we are dealing, I'm gonna skip this. We are all, I'm, I, so let's start with the fact that I'm saying that we're going to start with an invitation um, and the invitation is that not to go back to normal. The invitation is to say um, that we recognize that we're in the middle of a crisis, that historically we've been in this place before, uh, a version of this place before. Um, in the upper left hand corner, you see a picture of the 1974 Soweto walkouts um, where students took over the schools uh, and taught each other. Uh, at the bottom left corner is the Chicano walkouts, um, which is where the um, East LA 13 high school students, again, both of those are groups of high school students who've chosen to say that the education that they're receiving is not a meaningful one. It's not one that prepares them or their communities to be able to thrive uh, and to have meaning to understand their where they've come from and where they're trying to go, and also to maintain their languages and their cultures and their traditions. And we can see how this is not only something that's been in the past, but it's something we're currently dealing with. When we think about the relationship between climate change, uh, Black Lives Matter, and COVID, um, we can we can see that our other than human relatives are giving us this invitation. They're saying, pause and think about what is your role in society. So we should ask ourselves as math as mathematicians, as math teachers, what is our role? What what is what should we be doing in mathematics? Should we be the ones who are coming up with predictive models that are helping us make decisions? Are we are we the ones who are supposed to be um, um, crunching statistics and giving people new algorithms to follow? Are we um, what is it that we're supposed to be doing in our in our role here? And Sonia Renee Taylor, um, when the pandemic first started, had good language, this do not go back to normal. So I want to start with that. And she says, we will not go back to normal. Normal never was. Our pre-corona existence was not normal other than to other than we normalized greed, inequity, uh, exhaustion, depletion, extraction, disconnection, confusion, rage, hoarding, hate and lack. We should not long to return, my friends. We are being given the opportunity to stitch a new garment, one that fits all of humanity and nature. And so if we think about this from the perspective of mathematics, what might it look like if we chose not to go back to normal in mathematics? That would require us having a radical dreaming, a radical dreaming towards a world that does not yet exist. And I say towards a world that does not yet exist because for the most part, we've been doing mathematics and especially school mathematics in the same ways for decades um, and for you know about almost a century century um, that we um, we cannot reimagine something that we ourselves have not experienced so it becomes a difficult task on the one hand and yet it's a necessary task because we cannot just uh, continue to do what we're doing. We know in our hearts that it's not it's not working. And yet when we were given this invitation, when schools were given this invitation, um, for the most part, schools chose business as usual. In other words, instead of saying, hey, there's an invitation here for us to stop and think about what is mathematics? What role do we want mathematics to play in our lives? How do we want to, how is this an, an, a window that's opened up for us to um, do things differently. And I would say that we the one thing that we did do differently is our focus on socio-emotional learning. So I think many teachers now start their classes um, by checking in with students, by asking, how are you? Um, those kinds of things have become, you know, the new normal or, or a new kind of uh, way that we interact. And it's almost like students also expect that from us. And so when we go back to face-to-face -to -face teaching, on the one hand, um, there is this emphasis on content, but there's also that connection with students that may be a little bit different. And I'm hoping 
something that we that students will hold us accountable to that won't fall by the wayside. But for the most part, when we look at policymakers and we look at the decisions that are made, being made about schools, maybe not it, individual teachers are making these decisions, there's a focus on this kind of uh, learning recovery. So when students, have, there's this learning loss that students have had and so our role as math teachers is to catch them back up, get them back into um, into the space of doing mathematics and not necessarily saying, and do we want them to do the same kind of mathematics that we were doing before? I would argue that um, along with Bettina Love, Bettina Love's book is um, We Want to Do More Than Survive. She says that we are trapped in an educational survival complex, that our students are trapped in an educational survival complex. And so you see on the left there, there's a plant that's surviving. Um, it's surviving, it's it's eking its existence out. There's, you know, it's lost a lot of its leaves, but you know, it's it. you could say it's still alive. Um, and on the right there, you see a plant that's fully thriving, that has new shoots, that's um, taking up that space. And, uh, and so if we want to think about what are the things that are preventing thriving and mattering for students in learning mathematics, we have to first start with that truth. So what is the truth about the experience for students? And also, what is the truth of ours in terms of math teachers? What prevents us from thriving and mattering? So I encourage you to put that into the chat box. And as you are adding that, I'm going to continue to move on. Um, but I think that what you'll find is you're looking at other people's um, writings is that um, many of the things that prevent students from thriving and mattering are the very things that are preventing us as teachers from thriving and mattering. So when you think about what is your, when was the last time you felt pure joy in teaching mathematics? Um, what was that like? How did that feel? Um, when was the last time you think your students had that kind of experience? We've had important advances in culture in mathematics. Um, we have known that in terms of ethnomathematics that there are many mathematics that are practiced throughout the world. There's not one mathematics and that each of those uh, forms of mathematics have come from the places and the cultures that people have developed. In other words, the local spaces that people have thought about the problems in their world and have thought about how to relate to others in their world have created the notion of pattern. And if we think of mathematics as just the science um, or the study of pattern, then we can see why it would be important to think about the particular place that you're in. And so how would we navigate the stars and the sky? How would we think about um, the aesthetics that we're developing? How would we think about uh, calendars and, um, and even the number systems that we're coming up with? So that first part was the invitation. It was to say, here's this invitation. What do we want to do about it? The second part is to identify the current forms of mathematics that are untenable, that are not part of our radical dreaming. And so I have to ask myself, um, how does mathematics collude with anti-blackness and settler colonialism? What are the things that are present in um, the forms of mathematics that we teach, the forms of mathematics that we practice that uh, that fail to uh, challenge um, the relationship that we've had historically in terms of anti-blackness and settler colonialism. And one of those is universalism. So our emphasis on trying to get students to always come up with the general rule uh, for coming up with the most abstract version, um, for thinking about mathematics as always being universal. You know, we, we get these claims, we'll have other people tell us, um, well, two plus two is four no matter where you go. So how can you say that mathematics is not universal? Um, we often hear this phrase that mathematics is the universal language. And while that's true to a certain extent, um, so we can say, well, two plus two is four, um, depending on how you're constructing um, what your twos are, uh, we also can recognize that that overemphasis on universalism and abstraction um, highlights or kind of gets us into a spot of thinking that all mathematics is also objective because it's universal, because it doesn't um, have anything that's tied to any particular people. Uh, it's this thing that's kind of the equalizer, right? And that objectivism is um, what keeps people from thinking about context, um, from thinking about um, their own intuition, um, from thinking about uh, their bodies, their emotions, other kinds of things that are important. And so when we are taught that mathematics is universal, it also encourages us to follow a kind of compliance, that this is a set of rules that doesn't have an agenda, doesn't have any morals, doesn't have any um, power dynamics involved. This is just 
you know, universal stuff. And so it removes us from the kind of ethics. It removes us from thinking about more complete ways of knowing. Um, when we think about precision in mathematics, um, you know, the Common Core State Standards, the practice standard about precision is that, you know, we need to um, identify our units. We need to think about um, being precise and accurate. And that accuracy, again, can come at the expense of, well, who's deciding um, what these units, what, why these variables are even here? And are these the variables that we want in any given problem? So again, it's in that jump to kind of, you know, come up with the general rule to make it universal, to make it abstract. That abstract reasoning is the highest level of thinking, often in a math classroom, that we get away from more complete ways of knowing uh, that again come from more holistic views and also that move away from this idea that somehow there's a set of rules that we have to follow and rather see mathematics as a game that has its own axioms and so we can change those postulates we can change those axioms upon which they're based we can say we want to play a different kind of game in mathematics than we have currently uh, in place in schools I one of the things that's that's been hard for me in thinking about all of this is you know what what is it that's driving this system that we have if we think that there are things that are not working for teachers and not working for students why why are we why do we perpetuate it why are we continuing with it and one of the things that i feel like gets perpetuated one of the narratives that gets written in mathematics is that it's this idea that mathematics is useful that mathematics, um, you kind of, you better learn mathematics um, or else you're going to be left behind. You, you know, it's so useful for your life. And so we see here when I say that, that it needs a fuel source, many of the reasons that people end up learning mathematics and persisting in these kind of educational survival complexes is because they have a fear of something. There's a fear of losing. Maybe because we recognize that in a system where mathematics is the gatekeeper, only so many people are going to be winners. We know that mathematics, because it's been used as a proxy for intelligence in society, meaning like if you're if you if you tell somebody you're a math teacher, if you say somebody you're to somebody you're a mathematician, right away you get that kind of adulation response. You get people who say, you know, oh, you must be really smart, right? So there's this kind of correlation and this kind of notion that somehow all people who do mathematics are smart and people who don't do mathematics are less smart. Um, and so, you know, if you don't learn mathematics, you could be seen as dumb. Uh, you could also lose out if you don't do, if you don't study mathematics, because you might not be able to obtain that job, that STEM job in particular, that's going to give you a particular salary and a particular status in life. And so again, um, for many students, it's not that like, oh, I see this as something that I want to do, but this is rather something that I kind of better do or else I might lose out. And we can see, you know, again, how it relates to uh, being left behind in a technological society, maybe getting taken advantage of because you don't know how to read graphs or understand um, contracts, you know, whether those are with, you know, your credit card or your cell phone or, or something like that. So I want you to think for yourself. Now you are, as math teachers and as mainly as my high school math teachers um, and maybe math professors, we're all winners of a system that I'm asking us to now dismantle. Um, so in many ways, you may feel like fear really hasn't had that same feeling for you as it has maybe for some of your students. But I would argue that fear has played into all of our stories. Um, and so I'm asking you to think, what, if any, role has fear played in your story? Uh, have you been motivated to learn mathematics out of fear? Um, have you been convinced to go get that master's degree in mathematics because otherwise you won't get that step up and ladder for your uh, your salary? Have you been have you thought that like, well, I'll be more respected if I get another degree in mathematics as opposed to if I get a degree in uh, in education? And have you been prevented from learning mathematics out of fear? So go ahead and type that into the chat box. But what if we rejected fear and we replaced it with the desire for attachment? Um, so what you see here um, instead of the fire is you see uh, sweet grass, uh, sweet grass that's been braided um, and is the um, is the strength 
of many indigenous uh, communities. Uh, in particular, um, this, this piece comes from uh, Robin Kimmerer's Braiding Sweetgrass. Um, she's a Potawatomi scholar. And um, so what if we rejected fear and we replaced it with attachment? Uh, what, what would that mean? Why would attachment be an important thing for us to consider uh, how we are uh, connected to each other? So if instead mathematics as the science of pattern and as the study of pattern became you should be learning the new narrative that we would be trying to introduce would be that you um, that it's important to learn mathematics because this is how we see how we're all connected, how we're all related, how um, how we can see joy and in that connection that we're part of something larger. Right. And so if we think about mathematics as being the means to um, helping us further attach to each other as humans, and then I would argue that we can take it a step further and say, how do we learn to attach to land and to waters, um, then that's also something that could be a, a different um, a different way that we're moving forward. And so again, if mathematics can help us see and create patterns that connect us, connect us um, then our role as teachers might be instead to instill this longing for lifelong learning and wondering about each other and how we are the same and different from each other, how the patterns that we live um, are connected to the patterns that others live. Elsewhere, I've talked about um, these eight dimensions of rehumanizing mathematics. And um, the, again, the reason that at the center of that circle is the indigenous black uh, and people of color, women who are and who are queer folks, um, is because when we when we get to the point where, and in particular, school mathematics, but I would say mathematics in society as well, when we get to the point when the mathematics for queer and black indigenous women um, are free, then we know that everyone else has been freed. And so I'm borrowing that from the Combahee River Co Collective. And these different these different dimensions are basically saying these are the kinds of spaces that have been spaces of dehumanization, um, and so these are the ones that and that that can be shifted into a new way of thinking. So for each of those dimensions, uh, I find it a useful uh, practice to think about what are the typical narratives that are written in each of those dimensions, and then what are the counter narratives that we might want to write. And so if we think about what is the typical narrative that's been normalized in mathematics, um, we could think about like if we flip back and we look at, OK, let's say body and emotions. Well, one of the one of the current um, narratives that's written about body and emotions is that you don't need your body. You don't need emotions. In fact, if you bring emotions to the classroom, sometimes that's not exactly a helpful thing um, to be doing. And so that that idea that we should ignore our body, you don't need your body to do mathematics. You only need um, your brain and a computer or a calculator or paper pencil or something like that. And kind of in some ways, it's almost this sense that, you know, you should leave your body outside of the mathematics classroom, that it, the body is only ne needed to like carry the head that walks into the math classroom, but you don't necessarily, you're not gonna, you're not gonna attend to your body. And yet when we think about other, other forms of mathematics in, um, that have been developed and, and the ways that we actually are math, really mathematical um, before school, so much of that comes through our body. So, of that, so much of that comes through our emotions. We are, we are ingrained as, as humans um, to be mathematical and to think and to search for patterns, to search for joy. And so I think again about one of the things that's the greatest forms of dehumanization at such an early age, and that is um, counting. Um, when people, when young children are learning to count, and I would say, you know, we've, we've seen in mathematical studies with children as young as like four years old, they learn pretty early that, you know, we were born with this, with this set of manipulatives at the ends of our fingers, right? We have, we have 10 manipulatives right here. And if we can use our toes, we've got 20. Um, and, but people are taught very early in age that that's seen as a, um, as a primitive way of counting. So you actually using your fingers like that to think about how you would count or to add on, that's not seen as very intelligent. And so at a very early age, young children um, will put their hands under the table. 
Uh, we see adults do this, right? So people will put their hands under the table because there's a form of shame that says you don't, you shouldn't be using your body. You sh this should all be mental math. You should be able to do all of this in your head, right? And so again, we can take each one of these dimensions and we can think about what are the narratives that we write for people. And I don't mean it in the sense that like we stand in front of our students in classrooms and say, you don't need your body. You shouldn't bring your emotions, but it's, it's in the way that we frame the tasks and activities, it's the ways that we especially frame our evaluations, our assessments. Those are the things that tell students what we value. And so if we say we value cultures and histories, if we say we value students having windows and mirrors in their lives, if we say we value students actually creating mathematics, then all of those things have to come through in our practices and our in our evaluation systems. So I say that we first identify the kind of narratives that have been normalized in mathematics, and then we think about what's the counter narrative that we want to write. Because again, the purpose is not just to critique and to complain about, you know, there's things that aren't right in mathematics, but it's to say, what are we trying to move towards? What is this other possible future that we could be participating in, that we could actually not only envision, but embody and enact? And so when we think about that counter narrative, I think, well, we're part of this is that school mathematics erases all the forms of mathematics or many of the forms of mathematics that we have before we get to school, right? So, you know, young people um, find patterns in all kinds of things. They come up with their own ways of, of representing pattern. They um, they come up with their own systems of of counting and um, and and representing um, groups and things like that. And then and then you get to school and school teaches you you're no longer mathematical unless you present them in these specific ways, unless you show your work in these sanctioned ways that mathematicians do it. And again, at such an early age, we jump to that kind of generalization, the abstraction, which again are important tools and are important um, notions for mathematicians. But when we do that so early, by the time we get students in high school, they kind of have been taught that like, you don't need to really understand and think about this stuff in a way that feels whole for you, for you to be able to bring your whole self. You just need to be able to replicate the patterns that previous mathematicians before you have done. And so again, how do we bring back that which is erased through schooling? Um, and part of that is to recognize that um, many people continue to do forms of mathematics outside of what's sanctioned by school. Um, we can think about, you know, when uh, when people are putting away their leftovers um, in the in the evening and they're taking you know a round pot and they're needing to they're looking at a square you know a rectangular prism in there and they're thinking how do I get this into to, to this space? Nobody's taking out a measuring tape and is saying, okay, first I need to, you know, calculate the area of this circle of my pot. And then I need to think about the height of the pot. And then I need to, that's not happening. We haven't embedded this kind of natural um, reasoning. And so again, it's that, it's that formulization that comes early and it's that focus on getting the correct, the accurate, the precise answer before making our meaning. And what I refer to this kind of new form of storying or this new narrative that we're trying to put into place is restoring mathematics. And what I mean by restoring is two things, um, restoring without the why. Restoring means going back to that which we inherently uh, know and feel and uh, experience in our bodies and in our spirits and in our and in our minds um, as humans. So restoring that which gets erased by school and then restoring in the sense that we are telling a new story. And so it's that idea of, of we're pointing to a, a new future. And so what I love about restoring mathematics is that it's uh, consistent with indigenous perspectives in the sense that we have past, present, and future um, all, all together at the same time. And so for me, rehumanizing mathematics is, um, is bringing forward um, particular principles. It's an act of love that seeks joy and belonging and not just problem solving. So again, this goes back to the like, is our main message about mathematics that it's useful, that, it, that this is this kind of utilitarian narrative, or is it also that it brings us joy and it helps us see how we're connected to each other. Uh, rehumanizing mathematics is also a choice to center those who have suffered most 
from a Eurocentric and dehumanizing system that erases brilliance. Uh, it's a recognition that there are many ways of knowing, many knowers and many mathematics. So again, some of you may be involved in um, bringing in um, biographies of uh, black women uh, mathematicians. Um, you might be trying to get students to even think about their own uh, mathematical journeys. And in doing that, how do we position different people as, as mathematical knowers and, as, and doing different kinds of mathematics? And how and rehumanizing mathematics is also a form of clarity. It's a form of clarity that asks us to follow a different rhythm. So on the one hand, rehumanizing mathematics has at its basis the, the concept of nepantla. And nepantla means basically um, kind of neither and both at the same time. So we can think of this form of clarity asking us to follow a different rhythm. Um, there's this um, push right now for, you know, everybody, you know, to get the kids back in into classrooms and to get people back into learning. And and so I'm arguing that we we do need that, but we also need to slow down. And if we think about, you know, how trees um, function, um, you know, their their time frames are, you know, can be centuries. Uh, rather than, you know, this day and the next day. So, so Nepantla helps us think about um, how we need to both slow down and have that sense of urgency. So it's not a choosing of one or the other, but it's recognizing that um, those rhythms require us to not follow um, a set of rules, but rather to think about the complexity that's involved. And it's an active refusal to return to normal. I think that's the main part, part of it. it. And I said it's helping us restore and restory our relationship to each other and to the natural and spiritual worlds. So I've been talking about trees. I've been talking about, you know, uh, ways that we connect to the natural and spiritual worlds. And this is the third piece um, that I think it requires from us if we're going to do this restoring. And that is the shift. The shift is to say, we recognize in our history, their story, our story, that we are the younger brothers and sisters on this planet, that humans um, came after animals and plants and land and waters. And so if we shift our lens to, de to decenter humans, what forms of mathematics might we get? What forms of mathematical learning and teaching might we get? And so if we think of pattern and joy in relation to animal, plant, water, and land nations, and we center land and water as our teachers, how might that move us forward? So I want you to um, take a look at these pictures. Um, this notice and wonder stuff is, is what many people are doing these days in their classrooms. And so I feel like this maps perfectly onto um, ways that we can encourage students to notice and wonder things in the natural world. And in those noticings and wonderings, thinking about um, uh, thinking about those patterns, like how do we search for, acknowledge, and affirm the patterns that we belong to? So rather than seeing patterns as kind of outside of us, as something that we kind of identify and then we generalize, um, how do we first be in that moment of belonging, of, of recognizing how we're part of something larger? And when we are part of something larger, that comes the sense of, um, um, of, feeling like you have something to contribute, feeling like you have a sense of responsibility to others. Um, and in particular, in doing this work, thinking about how you are in relation to land and waters and plants and how we are dependent, interdependent um, on our other than human relatives. So you might've looked at that rope and you might've thought, you know, okay, um, um, it, what kind of a spiral is that? Um, maybe how many times is it spiraling? Maybe how long is the total rope? Um, you might have thought about um, what is rope made from? What kind of plant uh, is in that rope? Um, where is this? How is this rope being used? And um, on the right, um, you know, you might have recognized, okay, that's some kind of plant thing, but I'm not sure what it is, and I'm not sure what it's doing. But again, you might have focused on the spiral. Um, you might have focused on the way that it's curling itself. And there's many things you could have you could have thought about. So that picture that I showed you is is a maso, and masos are um, other otherwise referred to as fiddleheads. Um, masos are not a species of fern, but they're a growth strategy, and they follow a, a logarithmic spiral. And so um, they you know 
in terms of the, that logarithmic spiral, we just know that it cuts all of the radial lines at a constant angle. And but when we look at the way that mossos grow, um, they grow, they come up out of the kind of dead leaf in in um, with their heads down and they can grow all the way up to two feet out of the ground like this. And uh, and when we, when, so, so mossos are a food, um, they're, they're a food, they're, it's, mal, uh, mosso is the Maliseet nation um, word for fiddlehead. Uh, it's used in medicinal tonics, um, it helps clean the body of, of impurities and toxins, and when people, this is a, this is a ritual that people go into, um, into the forest or go into the fields and, and harvest and forage for this, this is a springtime tradition, and in many native communities, and it, in this one in particular is the uh, St. John River Valley in Canada. Um, well, it's part of part of the connection to Can uh, to Connecticut. But it's eaten. These fiddleheads are eaten as a vegetable. And um, but and so when we think about what we would study in this, if we were to study mossos, we could say, well, what what do mossos teach us? Well, on the one hand, um, you know, they can teach us about spirals. Um, and but they also if you harvest uh, mossos, you have to harvest them at just the right time. If you harvest them too late, they're bitter. They start to open up their 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 fronds kind of get um, um, papery. Uh, and when they're you know soft and and still firm, you can cook these in a pan. Uh, but if you try to harvest more than half, of the mossos that are growing there, um, they'll actually die. The whole plants, the plants will die because they're uh, in some ways connected to each other. And so again, you know, we can say, oh yes, I've done things like this. I've had students look at pine cones and and you know find Fibonacci sequences, or oh, I've had students look at you know something in nature. And but what happens oftentimes is that when we think about this, we it gets reduced to this notion that fiddleheads are showing us property, mathematical properties that we already know, right? So again, we come back to the like, okay, and as we're constructing this with my students, I'm making sure that they're understanding that, you know, all the radial lines are at a constant angle and what does this produce for us? But if we think about mossos as, as teachers, we have to be able to think about pattern in a larger definition and not just this kind of, um, geometric one or this algebraic one. And so what are the kinds of non-numerical things that mossos can teach us? What are the other forms of pattern? Um, and can they help us broaden our notion of what mathematics is, who it's by, and who it's for? So again, I think a lot of times in many math classrooms, we, we get we jump ourselves to, to first, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, formalizing uh, the patterns that we see without thinking, without sitting and thinking about where we can go. And so again, this is this is an example using Wolfram um, that is helping students see how this logarithmic pattern is is functioning. But again, if we want to learn about how to be in the world and not just about numbers, what might that look like? So I have here um, two poems um, and each is about mossos. Um, and you can think about what might it feel like for students to uh, have this emphasis on looking at uh, having fiddleheads or having mossos be our teachers and thinking about what else do they teach us. And so I'm going to read a piece of the um, poem that's to the right. And uh, this is Eileen Chong. And she says, the fern in infinite slowness uncurls each frond, each frond a sister to another. So many fingers and hands learning to flourish on the underside of things. The fern is steady, unafraid of the dark, pushing through stem, bark, growing vain by stubborn vein through morning dew and winter rain. Mists gather to watch the rills incise themselves and ripen with spores ready for release. The beginnings of another sprung from moss, fragile, maiden-like, translucent in the light. And I say, is there in Laketch? So in Laketch is the is the Mayan principle um, that is uh, windows and mirrors. You can think of it in that way, in the sense that in Laketch says, um, I see 
in Lakech recognizes that we are all just vibrations in this cosmos and that we are all our pattern, that we are all related to each other. And so in Lakech is recognizing that I see a version of you in me and a version of me in you. And so we can think about if we had our students um, looking at poems like this, maybe inventing their own poems, um, what would be the kinds of things they might come up with and how might that help them think about pattern differently? Um, the Journal of Humanistic Mathematics uh, has a section where there's mathematical poems. So mathematicians write these poems. And some of the emphasis on the poems is the um, the, anal the mathematical analysis of the structure of a poem. And other ones are um, poems like these that are about things in the world that feel mathematical. Um, and here's another one. Again, I'm not gonna read it, but we can see um, how, again, you know, the, the ways that the that the poem is said. So if we say compared with Euclid's elementary forms, nature loosening her hair exhibits patterns, sweetly disarrayed, afloat, uncombed, not simply of a higher degree N, but rather of an altogether different level of complexity. The number of the scales of distances describing her is almost infinite. So again, we can, we can think about um, what are the ways that we are bringing mathematics into the classroom that, uh, that allow us to have our other than human relatives as teachers. Um, this was something that I did with my students and that was that um, we said, what if we just created art based on this experience? And um, so for me, as somebody who does a lot of activist work, um, I was really interested in um, in our uh, fists and what is what is the mathematical pattern in the way that our fingers are shaped and it's a kind of an approximation of the Fibonacci sequence and so for me I produced this piece of of art that uh, had the fist and has the Fibonacci sequence and um, for me it represents more than just those numbers uh, as a Fibonacci sequence, it represents strength in numbers. And so that concept of strength in numbers is something that is a larger pattern for activists. So we can ask ourselves, what else can we learn from our relations? So what do we learn from falcons and how they approach their prey? Well, by keeping to that um, constant angle in approaching their, their prey, they never lose sight of prey, right? So, so we can think about what what is the purpose for our um, other than human relatives to be uh, living these patterns, to be showing us these patterns, and to be showing us other patterns that maybe we miss if we're only looking for kind of numerical relations. And so again, we can launch this kind of activity with our students. What do students notice and wonder? If I put, we put them into groups and, and they go into a room and they start seeing what, do, what kinds of pattern do we see? What kinds of things do we want to know more about? And how, and how, does, um, how does what you're seeing in the picture, is it a form of you and not a form of you? So what are the things that we see that are creating that attachment to each other? And then that attachment to, um, to land and waters. We can think about the role of the mathematical practices when we say construct a viable argument and critique the reasoning of others. We might insert before critique the reasoning of others, um, uh, appreciate the reasoning of others, see how the reasoning of others is connected to your reasoning. Um, make that attachment first before we critique somebody else. So again, we, we, there are so many examples of things that we can learn from. You know, why is it that um, uh, murmurations of starlings fly in the particular patterns that they do? Um, well, keeping track of only six other birds is going to be, you know, an efficient way for me to um, to be part of something larger. So again, you can think of this this um, murmuration of starlings that's at the top center, and say that's a pattern that they follow. Um, they all are following a kind of social algorithm that is saying, here's the thing we're all going to do together, right? Um, and and I learned recently uh, that you know. Uh, that when we see these pictures of starlings doing this, we should uh, we should not just say, oh, that's really beautiful. We, we also have to acknowledge the resistance and the resilience of these birds, because when we see these kinds of patterns, when they're all grouped together like that and they're making these different forms, it's because they're under attack. It's because they're trying to escape a predator. 
And so we don't want to just look out and say how beautiful. We also want to say how resilient, um, how important that they stay together in those ways um, to protect each other. So uh, I want to kind of leave us thinking about, can we imagine our classroom being a place where our students learn from other than human teachers? And if so, how and why? And if not, why not? So be thinking about that for yourself. What would that look like for me in my classroom? What, what, would, it, what would it take for me? What kind of things would I need to um, prepare myself for? What kinds of things would I need to learn? What kinds of partnerships might I need to come into? And again, if I'm being in right relations, um, I'm not encouraging people to simply use um, mussels or pine cones or murmurations of starlings as, as kind of um, props to say, here's this thing that we, we get to learn from. They're, they're like a representation of the thing we already know to learn, but we, we're literally saying, we're open to learning something new from you that we don't even know what we could learn. And in doing so, what's our sense of responsibility? So if I take, um, if I decide to have my students grow plants in my classroom and we wanna study something about them and we wanna think about the patterns that they're offering to us, whether it's about growth rate or whether it's about you know, other kinds of things, then what is our responsibility after we finish that project? Um, is part of our sense of reciprocity to those plants to go plant them back in the ground? Should, should our classroom maybe have some kind of space where we say, if we're learning from um, if we're learning from uh, a particular kind of butterfly or a particular kind of you know bug or an animal, should we be trying to create and um, support the habitats? for those as a kind of thank you for teaching us. And that's the role of reciprocity, that's saying more than just saying, we want land and waters to be our teachers, it's saying what's our role then in reciprocating and saying, and saying thank you for teaching and we have something to give as well. So what is needed at this time from my perspective is as a mathematics that's for problem solving and joy it's it's to thrive it's not just to uh, solve problems uh, and it's to underscore a broader notion of pattern again are we open to thinking about things like um, we put a lot of emphasis on symmetry in mathematics and yet in the biological world asymmetry is really important for protein folding for other kinds of things and so what what is it about asymmetry that we either haven't studied or don't emphasize that could be a way of opening up for students um, new uh, new avenues for thinking through mathematics? And again, we need a mathematics that's going to reconnect us with each other and with these lands and waters. This form of mathematics I'm talking about is in response to um, the crisis that we find ourselves in. And so I say, in terms of looking to the future, um, we're ready for change. Let us link hands and hearts. This is borrowing from Gloria Ansaldúa, um, who's a um, Chicana scholar. Um, she says, we are ready for change. Let us link hands and hearts together. Find a path through the dark woods. Step through the doorways between worlds, leaving huellas, those are um, um, footsteps, uh, footprints, for others to follow. Build bridges, cross them with grace, and claim these puentes, these bridges, our home. Si se puede, que así sea. So be it, estamos listas, we are ready. Vámonos. So now let us shift. So I ask us to think about if we are interested in this kind of radical dreaming, how do we accept the invitation? And part of the first part of accepting the invitation is to think about how we take it all in. Um, I ask us to breathe in and think about what does it look like when no one is hoarding in mathematics? What does it look like when consent is asked for and given? What does it look like when we are grateful for our relations and for what each contributes to the whole? What does it look like when past, present, and future are all within us in teaching mathematics and in learning mathematics? Can you imagine a mathematics that is healing, that supports us to thrive and matter, and not for recognition, but for our people and for our connection to this planet? And what would that mathematics look like? What would it feel like? What would it smell like? So take a deep breath in and exhale. And think about what do you long for? 
In mathematics, I feel like in so many ways we've been taught to deny our belongings, and yet we have this invitation in front of us. And so again, take a de deep breath in and think of what a new future in mathematics feels like and breathe out and release all of the ways in which you and your students have been harmed by mathematics. Breathe in again and imagine us building that future together and breathe out and let go of your attachments to the forms of mathematics that have been dehumanizing and that have kept us from connecting deeply with one another. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you much, much. Uh, uh, for, this for this powerful, powerful and inspiring, inspiring work. Yeah, let's give her a, a round, round of applause. Of applause. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Dr. Gutierrez. Um, uh, we do have we a have little, little bit of time for, for some Q&A here. Um, so if you want to type questions into the chat, I'll read them out to Dr. Gutierrez. Um, but as we get started on that, NCSSM facilitators, if you could go ahead and get meetings started for the 11 o'clock so that they're ready to go, that would be fabulous as well. So any questions for Dr. Gutierrez? And maybe it doesn't have to be questions. Maybe it can also be comments. What 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 is going through your mind right now? Yeah, and thank you also for everyone's um, active participation in the chat, Dr. Gutierrez. It was on fire during your session, so very um, thought provoking points there. Um, we ha we do have one question here. Where would you want teachers to begin? The Journal of Humanistic Mathematics, perhaps. I think you should begin whatever makes sense for you, whatever feels like is a connection. If 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 seeing if your way into this was wow that the 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 poetry really spoke to me, then that is the way in for you. If the way in for you was wow, I really need to think about you know my my participation in terms of like reparations for indigenous people. Maybe I should be reaching out to you know local community and finding out how can I learn to think about how to be in relation to land. Um, if it was a, so, I think whatever feels right to you is the space that you should that you should move towards. And again, I think the main thing is to um, is to have the patience, well, to have the patience and the urgency <laughs> um, to move this work forward and not feel like you have to be the sole arbiter of the truth that you bring to your students, but rather to think about how can you be in partnership with other teachers, um, with community members, um, and uh, and not do the work alone. Thank you. Any advice for bringing your colleagues along on this journey? Um, I think one of the things that's just very, that's just very um, visceral is the the feeling of um, dehumanization that many students experience, that many people, the trauma that's so prescient when you as a math teacher talk to other people and you hear the ways that they have been either convinced that they're not mathematical or that they um, uh, that they can't learn this, you know, at a later point in life. And, and I, I, this for me is different than the whole kind of growth mindset stuff. I feel like this idea of, you know, how do we bring forward this notion of attachment and joy and belonging as part of mathematics and not as a tacked on thing. So I think one place to start is to kind of start with that trauma. Like, what is the trauma that that people that you either know of that other people experience and or that you've experienced? I, I, I've been teaching math methods for 25 years at the University of Illinois, and my students are mathematics majors and they are education minors and they are um, they are very strong in mathematics. But when they get to college level mathematics and those courses are courses with you know 200 people in them or more and where the professor is is going so fast and there's a focus on theory before students have really even been able to understand how to do theoretical work in mathematics because so much of what they've done in high school has been more kind of procedural um, and and conceptual but it's more you know it's more applied then there's even a sense of trauma for them and a questioning that like 
am I really that good? I think one of the one of the narratives we write in mathematics is that if you're a mathematician, you need to be good at mathematics all the time in all topics. And that's actually just not true. When you think about mathematicians, if somebody is an algebraic topologist or if somebody is, you know, a geometer or whatever, they don't know how to talk about all the other mathematics that their colleagues do. But we have this impression in society and I think in classrooms because teachers feel the sense of showing students all the mathematics that they know. And so I think it's it's maybe starting with what is the trauma that they people know of from others and also, you know, again, potentially your own and thinking about how does that open the door for us to say, we don't just want everyone to be good at the forms of mathematics that we have had historically in classrooms. Thank you. One more question here. Um, how do you have any suggestions for how to make this a cross curricular school wide conversation? Oh, I think this is this is an easier kind of cross curricular conversation because I think mathematician math teachers are often the ones who are less interested in doing things that are whole school. Um, we're often the ones who want to be the exception um, to the rule. And so these kind of uh, interdisciplinary units um, that people do in schools, it's often harder to feel like you fit into that because you've got a, a you know kind of rigid curriculum that you're trying to march through. I think if it came from somebody in the math department and said, "We what I'm really interested in thinking about how could the students in science be actually studying some of the biology and chemistry of these of these other than human teachers that we're learning from, um, we could be thinking about what are the kinds of patterns and what and what ways does this um, do, do these new teachers um, both show us patterns that have been sanctioned by, you know, human mathematicians, but also maybe are showing patterns that are not so obvious? How can the English teachers be writing about helping the students write the poems and the and the, and the art teachers coming up with representations of, you know, some kind of gallery showing that might be something that would be presented in the community or to parents um, or to another grade level um, so that it would be like a gallery walk kind of thing, or if it was online, it could be, you know, the same kind of. So I, I think that this is ripe for an interdisciplinary unit and a whole school kind of getting on board with the idea of, of attachment and, and connection, because again, it's very much reflective of the moment that we're in with COVID and Black Lives Matter and climate change. Well, thank you um, so much. Um, I'll just share real quick that um, uh, there is the last question is, is there a book you, that you have written about rehumanizing mathematics? And um, and yes, yes, there is. <laughs> And and papers, um, so maybe we can um, drop that information into um, the files for you all. Do you want to give a little bit of transition time for our 11 o'clock sessions? Um, so thank you again so much, Dr. Gutierrez, for joining us today and for sharing those, again, inspiring and powerful words. And thank you, everyone, for your engagement in this session. And um, I think this is just such a great note to start our conference off on. So enjoy the rest of your time here. The session should be started for 11 o'clock. Keep the conversation going. We've got lots of chats you guys can keep discussing, sharing ideas with, and thank you all. Have a great day.